Well, good morning, church. Uh, if you have not been with us over the past few weeks, we have been just taking a look at the church, what the Bible says we should be as a church, what God's plans for us are as a church. So week one, we looked at how God has gifted every one of us within his body to build up and to serve one another. In, in week two, we saw that we have been called, called to, to glorify God's and God and everything that we think and say and do and, and feel and all that, that our whole lives would ultimately glorify God. We've been called to live lives worthy of the calling that we have received. Last week, we talked about how God has sent us. There's a lot of things that God desires for his church to do, but there's some he just laid out very specifically, and he has sent us to go and to make disciples. Today, what I want to talk to you about are, are just four prayers that I have for the church, for this church, what I, what I desire to see God do in and through us as the body of Jesus Christ. I believe God desires to do these things uh, in and through us. And, and here's the deal. These these are the things that, that we've got to constantly return to. These are the things that we've got to continually focus on because the, the older a church gets, the more mature the body of Jesus Christ gets, uh, the more we're, we tend to want to drift away from the things that we did at first, away from the first love, if you will. And so uh, today I want to point you toward four things, four prayers that I have for our church, four prayers that I would want us to pray corporately for this body of believers. If you have your Bibles, turn with us to Mark chapter 2. Now, Jesus is returning to Capernaum. He's been here before. He's done some miracles before. He's coming back to Capernaum. In, in chapter 2, verse 1 of the Gospel of Mark, it says, When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. Now, Jesus is not in the synagogues. He's not preaching in the squares. He's just hanging out in the house. Now, um, this story is recounted in both in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all tell a story, so I'm going to bring in a few details that are revealed in the other gospel. So if you wonder, where did he come up with that? I'm just kind of bringing it in from, uh, in particular, Luke's gospel. He gave, he gave some descriptions. And the thing that I want you to see here is that Jesus has come on the scene. He's at the beginning of his ministry. And the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders from all the surrounding villages in, in Jerusalem, in Galilee, in, in, in Judea, they're coming to hear what Jesus has to say. They've gathered at this house today because they want to hear what Jesus has to teach. Verse 2, and many Many were gathered together so that there was no longer room, not even near the door, and he was speaking the word to them. So Jesus is doing what Jesus does. He's, he is teaching the word. He's speaking the word. He's revealing God the Father to, uh, at this point, the scribes and the Pharisees. He's speaking the word to the people. There's an interruption, however. In verse 3 it says, And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Now, I can't help but wonder what made these guys decide, you know what, we're just going to get our friends to Jesus. Maybe they caught word that he was hanging out in this house, in their city. They remembered what Jesus had done on his last visit, and they're like, we got to get our friend to Jesus. In verse 4, being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. Now, this is going to take some context for you. So, uh, in the time of Jesus, in these days, this house was likely the house of Peter. We're not told explicitly, but it would have been a working man's house, okay? We're not talking about thatch huts, right? We're not talking about a massive mansion or a villa. This was probably just kind of a modest working man's home that would have had a flat roof. Uh, there would have been a stairway on the side of the house where when, that, when it got hot, in the afternoon, they would go up on the roof where there would be more, uh, more of a breeze, more ventilation. Now, the roof would have been constructed of, of wooden timbers with probably some branches laid over, and then they would place tiles. These tiles on top of them would have been uh, some straw and then some mud, which they, would, they had a heavy roller, and they would compress the mud so that it would shed water. So when it says that they dug an opening in the roof... Um, they dug an opening in the roof. I want you to kind of see what's going down here, okay? Jesus is teaching the most important, and, and here air quotes for that, so he is teaching some of the most known and heralded religious teachers of his day. Every man in that room on that day could likely quote you the first five books of the Old Testament. They could have probably quoted much of the prophets, uh, much of the law to you. Like they, These guys were really learned. They were the PhDs from seminary, okay? They're listening to Jesus teach. They're evaluating what he's, what he's saying, and all of a sudden there's this horrible commotion on the roof. What's going down? Jesus is trying to teach. He has to talk a little bit louder. There's this commotion. They began to, to dig away at, at the clay and the straw and at the tiles. And suddenly, uh, there, there's like bits of, of, of debris and dirt falling. Jesus is trying to teach. It's distracting for everybody. 
But it doesn't stop them. They open up a hole in the roof, the light shines through, and then they're lowering a guy down on a mat. Like, this is a pretty, hey, listen, I can handle some distractions, you know what I mean? But I don't know how Jesus held it together here. This had to be pretty difficult as he was trying to teach these important religious leaders. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralytic was lying. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic son, Your sins are forgiven. I wonder if the, if the friends could have even dreamed about They're like, man, like Jesus is going to forgive his sins because this is a big deal for them, right? They brought this guy to Jesus and he's just performed this miracle for their friend. When, when I talk to you about prayers that I have for our church, my prayer is that we may be a church that welcomes the broken. We may be a church that welcomes the broken. These guys, they brought their friend to Jesus, but there was such a big crowd outside that they couldn't even get close to the door, all right? I mean, the house is full. It's a small house. It's packed. They can't get close to the door. What, what I hope is that would never be true of us as the church of Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm going to talk in two contexts today about what happens here in our corporate worship, but also about what happens with us when we're outside of these walls. It is my prayer for us as a church, both gathered and scattered, that we would be a church that welcomes the broken. If you read the next passage just below this one, Jesus he approaches a tax collector named Matthew. He says, Matthew, come and follow me. And he goes to Matthew's house. He's hanging out. They're having dinner. And the religious people are going, Jesus, why are you hanging out with tax collectors and sinners? Like, don't you know that woman's a prostitute? Do you know how it looks for you to be sitting across the table from her? Like, she has a bad reputation. This guy's attacked. Why are you hanging out with these people? And Jesus says, hey, hey guys, um, it's, it's not the healthy they need a doctor. It's the sick. The reason I'm hanging out with, with these broken people with these, is because they need a doctor. They're sick. There's brokenness in their life. And I, I happen to come to restore that which is broken, right? Jesus tells them, and I believe this should be true for our church as well, that we should in many ways, both gathered and scattered, we should be a hospital for sinners. We should be a place where sinners feel welcome to join us both here as we gather and they're welcome wherever we might be out in the community. Now, I want you to think about this. And this is, this is just kind of pushing back on, on what we maybe have known in church culture. Can you imagine how strange it would be to walk into a hospital, man, there's people here and there. Here's a guy who's, who's obviously injured, uh, someone who's obviously sick, and the doctor is coming around to them, and he's saying, hey, hey, what's going on? I want to help you. And, the, and they, they stick out their hand, and they're like, hey, brother, everything's fine with my family. Life is really good, right? I mean, it's just, I'm glad to see you on this Sunday. Life is great. You would think, what is that guy doing? Why would he pretend there's a doctor here who desires to help him? It is my desire that we would not be that kind of church. That we would not feel like we had to show up here on a Sunday morning and put on a, a, a pretty face and pretend like everything's perfect in our family and that there's nothing going on. Listen, Jesus came to heal the sick. It's the sick who needed the doctor. That's why Jesus came. He wants to make us well. And what I don't want to happen is we gather here or we gather in our small groups outside of, of this worship center that we are in. Uh, what I desire for us is that we could just be honest about what's going on in our lives. Hey, Jesus. Man, I'm really sick. Hey, Jesus, I'm, I'm paralyzed. I need, you, I need you to bring healing. Jesus, I've been walking in this depression, and it's so dark. I can't even see my way out. Jesus, would you work in me? Jesus, I, I've fallen back into this addiction and this broken, brokenness in my life, and I need you to lift me up again. It's my hope for us as a church that we always welcome the broken. And the reason for that is because we all come here broken. There's not a man or a woman in this room that due to sin, due to our own wickedness and some of our own bad choices, isn't broken and hurting inside. I want this church to be a place where it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be honest about what's going on. I don't want it to be like, you know, at a hospital. Hey, doc, I just thought I'd come and learn some new medical terminology today. Just hang around the hospital, see how things work. If, if we're here... We're here to meet a Savior. We're here to meet our healer. We're, we're gathered here. We gather in our groups that we might be made whole again by the work of Jesus Christ. It is my first prayer for us. 
that we would be a church that welcomes the broken. There was a, there was a guy, uh, his name's Bartimaeus. You might have heard this story. Jesus, Jesus is walking along the road, and Bartimaeus, uh, he didn't get cultural convention. You know what I mean? Y'all ever have that friend, that one friend that's way too loud? Like you're in a restaurant, and you're like, dude, you're like inside voice. Or, you know, the, this happens to me with my kids in the car. Like they have no idea that they're screaming, but they are. So here's this guy, blind Bartimaeus. He hears Jesus is coming, right? Jesus, he's like the son of God, right? He's the Messiah. And blind Bartimaeus, like he, he's blind, so you give him a little grace here. But he just starts yelling and not comfortable, like acceptable yelling. He's going, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And it's loud enough that people are like, hey, Bartimaeus, tone it down. You know, there's a crowd here. I don't know if you can see that or not. Jesus. Son of David, have mercy on me. He's yelling to Jesus. And so uh, they're like, hey, hey, chill. You know, and of course Bartimaeus doesn't do it. And Jesus comes up to him and he looks Bartimaeus in the face and he says to him, hey, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus very honestly says, Jesus, I want to regain my sight. Jesus, I want to see again. I, 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 I want to see again. I want to experience what I once experienced. Jesus, I, I, I've had this injury. I have this thing that's come up. I'm blind and I want to see again. It's my heart for every person in this room that you could know that Jesus Christ is here today. The same God that healed blind Bartimaeus desires to bring healing into your life as well. And it may not happen as quickly as it happened with blind Bartimaeus, but he wants to begin the process of taking your brokenness and making you whole again. That's a process that's ongoing in my life today. There's brokenness back there, and Jesus is making me whole. The question that I want you to entertain today is what would you tell Jesus if he asked you that question? What do you want me to do for you? He is here. He wants to work in your heart. He wants to work in your life today. What do you want Jesus Christ to do for you today? James chapter 5. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other that you may be healed. Did you know that in the church of Jesus Christ we're only as sick as our secrets? The part of the normal function of this body of Jesus Christ is that we ought to come and be like, listen, Listen, God, I'm I'm struggling with pornography again. Man, it's not what I want. It's not what I desire. But I'm, I'm in the midst of it, and I need you to pray for me. That you could come to your community group and say, Listen, my marriage is about to fall apart, and I'm losing hope. Man, would you guys pray for us? What we don't want to do is come and pretend that we're all okay here. What we know is we are broken people whom Jesus is making whole once again. And, and, and we don't want to pretend We don't want to pretend like we got it together because those are the people that don't get made well, right? May we be a church that welcomes the broken. Number two, I want you to think about these guys. These four friends. Isn't isn't this extraordinary what they did for their friend? Now, there's, there's, there's a peculiar line that struck me as I began to read about these guys. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It's pretty early on. So uh, these guys have probably had an encounter with Jesus before because it says when they lowered him down and Jesus sees the paralytic there laying there, he, he, he notices their faith. That is a plural, their faith. Not just the faith of the paralytic, but also of these other men. Apparently, these guys had had an experience with Jesus Christ. Now, if you were going to hang out with a paralytic in the days of Jesus Christ, you would need to know the paralytic, he, he's an outcast, right? The paralytic, he's not someone that you hang around. He hangs around with the, the other lepers and people who would, who would have had various disabilities. And what you might have thought about them, as the Jews would have thought about them, is that the reason he was disabled, this paralytic, would have been because there was sin in his life or in the life of his parents. Like, if you were a Jew, you would have seen him as unclean. He could never come in to worship fully like, the, like people who could be considered clean. So these four guys... They see this paralytic whom they knew, and they take action on his behalf. I can't help but think that maybe these four guys had had a similar experience with Jesus. Maybe one of them was was the guy who Jesus had cast a demon out of when he was previously in Capernaum. Maybe one of these guys was a paralytic himself or had some other level of brokenness in his life. But what happened was Jesus had done something in the lives of these men that when they saw a need, what they didn't do is respond with indifference. 
They didn't respond with like, you know, I'm not really sure Jesus is going to do anything about that. It seems that maybe these guys had been healed. And so when they saw the need, when they saw the, the, the paralytic laying there, they thought, man, we've got to get this guy to Jesus. We've got to do something about this. What they expressed on that day is what I hope is expressed in us. It's my prayer that God would build this type of faith in us, build this type of faith in you and I, that we would be big thinking, risk-taking, obstacle, leaping faith kind of people, that we would just believe that God is is still in the miracle business, that we wouldn't be like, you know, we live in the 21st century and, you know, it just doesn't seem like Jesus does the cool stuff anymore. And so we're going to show up to church and we're going to kind of pray for people, but we're not going to believe that God can do that stuff anymore. Listen, I pray that that's not us. I want us to be the, the big thinking, risk-taking, obstacle-leaping kind of people that will do anything to get people to Jesus because we believe that our God is still able and he's still willing. Think about this. They saw a guy laying there paralyzed. And, and, and they could have thought, you know, maybe Jesus will you know, walk around, go for a walk. Maybe he'll see this guy and, 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 and get, Jesus can do something. But that's not what they did, right? They're like, okay, he's paralyzed. Somebody get a mat. Somebody get a mat. We're going to get him to Jesus. Well, there's just a couple of us. Call our friends. we got to get him to Jesus. There's four guys. They march up. They see a large crowd. It's so big that they can't get near the door of the house. They could have made excuses, right? Well, you know... I, Seems like it's kind of full in there. I guess maybe, I, maybe today's not the day. Maybe God's not working, right? This is what, what happens when we pay attention to circumstances. Yeah, it seems like God's not really in that today. And these guys, it's like, hey, if, if we can't get near the door, let's try, let's try the balcony, right? They go up the steps. Well, hey, guys, bad news. It's not a balcony. It happens to be a roof. And they say, hey, somebody get me a shovel. And they just start digging because they're going to do anything it takes to get their friend to Jesus. They had this, this kind of big thinking, risk-taking, like obstacle-leaping kind of faith that says it doesn't matter what the obstacles are. We are going to be committed to getting this man to Jesus. I pray that we, as the people of God, who have received healing ourselves, people who have received this thing in us, the gospel, the hope of Jesus Christ in our lives, that we would be those kind of people that will do whatever it takes to get people to Jesus. That when we see needs, we don't think, yeah, I don't know. Maybe God's not into that, you know? Maybe, you know, maybe Jesus will come by and he'll do something, but he's not, he's not really interested in me being a part of that. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's for me. So I pray that we're men and women who have this kind of faith, that when we walk through our lives, we go through our city, we're here, we're in Pecola, or wherever it is that you live, that you see the brokenness of this world, and you're like, man, God's calling me to enter in. Like, I'm just going to begin to pray extraordinary prayers. I'm just going to offer myself in faith in an extraordinary way and say, God, would you do something? Listen, you can't do it. Do you know these guys couldn't heal the paralytic? Like, they, they literally, they couldn't, they couldn't heal him, Right? They wanted to bring him to Jesus. We don't have the power in and of ourselves to change any of the circumstances that we're going to see in our society. But we have the power to bring people to Jesus. We can begin to pray big and bold prayers asking God to do the extraordinary. We can enter into the brokenness and minister as we're able to minister and pray that God would just kind of come behind us in the power of his spirit and do great things. You saw the video of Cain Riggs who used to see men who were just like himself, who were suffering from addiction and brokenness. And he's like, I'm going to do something about that. Like God called him to do something about that. And now he's got 18 men. He's had a lot of guys go through there. And God has done an extraordinary work in many of them because he wasn't content to be like, well, if Jesus wants to save, I guess I'll just let him do it. Jesus wants to use you. I pray that we would be people who have this big thinking, risk-taking, obstacle-leaping kind of faith that won't give up at the first sign of difficulty. But we will be just like if Jesus was standing in our place. We're like, okay, I have the Holy Spirit of God. I'm going to enter into this. There's a story in the Old Testament. It's one of my favorite stories. Like anything back there. Uh, there's, there's, there are two armies. I'm going to be as quick as I can. Sorry. Two armies. There's the, the armies of God, the nation of Israel. And they're on one pass. You're going to see this a lot in the scriptures. On the, uh, on the other side of the pass, like a big valley, you have an outpost of the Philistines. And the armies of God are in bad shape. There's not very many of them, for one. Like they're, they're way outnumbered by the Philistines. And it just so happens they don't have any weapons. It's, it's a tough day, right? It's, you don't want to be in those circumstances. So we find that all the fighting men of the nation of Israel who were present on that day, they're just hanging out in the shade. There's a pomegranate tree. They're all just trying to, hey, I want to be as comfortable as I can. 
man, I don't know, I can't win this battle. I'm just going to try to be as comfortable as I can. And there was a young man named Jonathan. He was a friend of David. If you remember King David in the Bible, he was a friend of David, and he has an armor bearer. And so Jonathan, he just he thinks about this situation, and he can't stand that nothing's being done. And he says to his armor bearer, he says, hey, let's go up to the Philistines. Now remember, they don't have the weaponry. They don't have the numbers on their side. He's like, hey, let's go up to the Philistines. He says, perhaps. Now, think about this. If I'm going into a life or death battle, I'm not going on into the battle with the word perhaps, right? He says, perhaps the Lord will work on our behalf. Perhaps? I'm like, no, bro, I need you to hear a word from God or I'm not going, right? This is serious. I'm going to die. Perhaps the Lord will work on our behalf, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by few or by many. Perhaps the Lord's, hey, hey, come with me. Maybe God's going to do something big here. Let's enter into this. And so they don't have a tactical advantage either, right? They're climbing up cliffs where the Philistine soldiers are. Hey, here's our strategy, uh, armor bearer. We're going to show ourselves to the Philistine army. We're not going to sneak up on them. We're not going to, like, you know, come in. We're just going to show ourselves to them. And, and, and if they act a certain way, we're going to know that God's going to give them into our hands. And on that day, Jonathan and his armor bearer, when all the mighty trained men of God sat content to do nothing, sat contented in the shade, this young man and his armor bearer, they, 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 they climb up the cliffs, they show themselves to the Philistine army, and God does the extraordinary on that day. It had nothing to do with their fighting skills or their superior weaponry. They were at a tactical disadvantage. They didn't have the numbers, but God did something great. I believe that God wants to do something great in and through his church, in this community, in our county, but we've got to enter in. We've You've got to have this big thinking, risk-taking, obstacle-leaping kind of faith that says, I'm not giving up until I get him to Jesus. God, my marriage is broken, but I'm not giving up. I'm going to bring this thing to Jesus. I'm going to believe, God, that you can do something. Man, my son is addicted. My daughter is addicted, but I'm not giving up. I'm going to get him to Jesus. If I have to get the whole church praying, I'm bringing him to Jesus. Lord, our community is broken. Man, there are kids without parents. There's this addiction problem. There's poverty, but we're going to bring them to Jesus. There is hope in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray that we can have faith that is big, big thinking, risk-taking, obstacle, leaping kind of faith as the church of Jesus Christ, that we might live for something other than being comfortable while we're here on this earth, that we can have a bigger vision for our lives and have a nicer junk than we already have. Or more comfort than we already have, we only get one life. And God wants to use us. He wants to use you. Listen, those four guys, they didn't do any healing. They just believed that God could do something. And Jesus saw their faith, and he forgave that man's sins on that day. There's more people here in this story. There's a couple more prayers I want to go over with you today. Verse 6 And it's easy to fall into this. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Some of the religious people who had all the knowledge in their heads, who probably knew every verse Jesus would have quoted, who knew what the prophets said, who knew the law, who knew the things, they were sitting there thinking, reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak this way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to them, why are you reasoning about these things in your heart? Guys, did you see what just happened here? I just forgave a man's sins. The guys who had every bit of the law, like memorized, who knew the prophets. And and by the way, the law and the prophets pointed toward Jesus. Like they had all of this knowledge and they, they were missing the fact that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Like they'd come and heard and they'd studied and then they'd learned all of what the scripture said, but it never took root in their hearts like they missed Jesus. And so here they are, they're they're actually telling the Son of God, you must be sinning against God because you just forgave a man's sins. Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were reasoning that way within themselves, said to him, why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He looks at the paralytic. He says, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. My third prayer for our church is that we don't fall into this same thinking that the the Pharisees did on this day. My third prayer for our church is that we may be a church of doers. 
and not just hearers. There is this, this thing that happens when maybe you've been saved for a year or two years or five years or ten years where you kind of forget what God has done on your behalf. You forget that you were once the person on the stretcher that somebody had to bring to Jesus. You forget that you were the one suffering from addiction or brokenness or depression or, or your marriage was falling apart. We forget where we came from. We lose sight of what Jesus has done for us. And we show up every week and we hear. We hear the word preached over us, and we, we hear the gospel. We hear uh, about the teachings of Jesus, how to walk in the abundant life, and we walk away, or, or we sit here just like the Pharisees. Hey, yeah, that's a pretty good sermon. Yeah, I mean, you kind of missed it on that point, right? I mean, we, we talk about the sermon, but we never let it impact our hearts. We never hear, we never internalize the word of God. We become hearers and not doers. James 1.22, he encourages the believers. He says, I want you to be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. There's this easy trap to fall into where we come to church and we, we hear the word preached and we amen what's being said, but we don't actually go home and live that out. The way Jesus talked about it, that is he said there's, there's one guy that's building his, his, his life on the sand. The one who hears the words but doesn't put them into practice. He's building his life on the sand. And when the storms come and the winds blow and the difficulty of life comes, his house is going to fall down. But there's a guy who's building his life on the rock. The one who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, that's the guy who's building his life on the rock. It doesn't matter what's going to happen. It's going to stand. Listen, I want us to be rigorously biblical in all that we do as a church. I believe we should. I think our elders are going to fight you on that one, right? We're going to be rigorously biblical about all that we do. We want to courageously stand upon the Word of God. What we're not going to be as a church is one of the churches that's like, oh, that text is kind of difficult. I'm just going to take a step back and pretend I know better than God. We're not that church, right? And I don't want to be that church. We should pride ourselves in standing on the Word of God. But more importantly... We should pride ourselves on actually living out the Word of God. We don't just stand on it or claim it or preach it. We live it out. May we be doers of the Word when we encounter the difficulties in our lives. With the, difficult, the difficult portions of text where we're like, oh, Jesus, I don't understand. What we don't want to do is say, okay, but I know better, and so I'm going to undermine the Word, or I'm going to explain away the Word, or I'm going to ignore that portion. What we want to do is say, Jesus, I don't get it. And this is hard. I don't understand but I'm going to trust you with it. Because one day I was on a mat. Some guys lowered me down through a roof, and you did a miracle, and you've forgiven me of my sins. And if you can do that, I'm just going to trust that you know better than I know. We go to our community groups. We spend time with people who know us. Listen, the person at the end of your row probably doesn't know you all that well. What we want to do is live in Christian community with other people. People that get to know us. They get to see into our lives. They see our blind spots. They can say, hey, hey, Jason, I know you're, you're preaching on Sunday, you're, you work in a church, but let me tell you about something I'm seeing in your life that doesn't match up with anything you said on Sunday. It's not okay for you to talk to your wife that way. It's not okay for you to just spend your money like it's all for you. Like we need people in our lives who can kind of direct us and help us see the things. You know the trouble with blind spots? You can't see them, right? You need people to speak into that process. We push you to groups here uh, for a purpose. We want you to have people that can walk through you and help you become like Christ. Lives that are doers of the gospel and not merely hearers of the gospel. The final prayer that I have for us is that we may be a church. Now, this is super nerdy, but just bear with me, okay? That we may be a church that has gospel motivations and gospel explanations. Look in verse 12 at what the paralytic does here. He's just had his sins forgiven. His eternity is forever changed. He's going to be in heaven with God. That though on this earth he was considered despised and lowly and outcast, he's now just been embraced and adopted by God. How powerful that was, right? And this guy, he's just received the most extraordinary gift he can ever get from Jesus. But then Jesus went a little bit further in his life. He's like, hey, I want you to pick up your mat. I want you to get up and walk out of here. Like, think about this healing that's happened. Verse 12, and he got up. And immediately picked up the pallet, and he went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, We've never seen anything like this before. Man, I've never seen anything like this. 
You see, what happened on this day is this guy begins to recount, here's what Jesus did for me, man. I, like they, they literally cut a hole in the roof. They dropped me down. And he was like, your sins are forgiven. And then the guys were like, you can't forgive sins. And he's like, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go a step further. I'm going to make him walk too. Like he's telling the story and he's excited. Listen, Jesus had done something extraordinary for him. And very naturally, he went and told other people what Jesus could do for them. He begins to tell the story of what Jesus has done on his behalf. Have you ever had someone come and knock on your door to do evangelism? Y'all ever had this happen? And it looks like they're going to a funeral. And they're like, you know, they're a little nervous and they've got a canned presentation they're going to do. And they're like, oh gosh, I got to go knock on this door and tell someone about Jesus. I don't think that's God's plan for us at all. I believe and I pray that we'll be a people who are motivated by the gospel, who have gospel motivations because of what Jesus has done for us to tell other people about what Jesus could do for them. Like no one's twisting this guy's arm. He's not doing this out of duty like, oh, I know I'm supposed to evangelize. So here I go. I want to do my best. Listen. God had done an extraordinary thing in this guy, and he couldn't wait to tell the people around him about what Jesus had done. I pray that that's us. That like, God, like, we can tell our story so many times that we could say, there was this time I was down on the mat. I was on this cot. Someone brought me to Jesus. I was addicted, and someone brought me to Jesus, and he set me free. I was the guy who was blind, but now I can see. I was the guy who was lame, and now I can walk. My marriage was falling apart, and Jesus did something that we could tell the story about what Jesus has done for us and give hope to other people that Jesus could do the same for them. The people are like, we've never seen anything like this before. Man, how incredible would it be if in LaFleur County people are like, I've never seen God do anything like what he's doing at Cross Community Church. And we pray this for every church in our county, that God would do extraordinary things here. We pray that we as people would not see telling what God has done for us as some sense of duty. That we come like sober-faced and all funerally, if that's a word, right? Like we're, like we're sad about it. Like, oh man, I don't want to tell you what Jesus has done for me. Like we could come and be like, let me tell you, Jesus set me free. And Jesus, he changed my life. I was dead and he made me alive. I was addicted. He set me free. That we as a church, my prayer for us is that with gospel motivations... We would go out and give gospel explanations. Sometimes the, the temptation for those of us who've been walking with Jesus for a while, I said earlier, we forget where we came from. We forget what Jesus has done for us, and we start th thinking things or saying things like, you need to try harder. We see people broken. We see people in the ditches. We see people who are down and out, and we're like, yeah, you need to try harder. Self-control, and you'll get through that addiction, right? Uh, or or just, just be a little bit better. You know, study more, pray a little more, just do a little more work. But we forget that when we came to Jesus, we were just like the paralytic. We, we brought nothing to the table. The gospel says you did nothing, but Jesus did everything in the whole deal. Like we just came as sinners, and Jesus is the one who made us alive together with Christ. We have been justified freely by faith alone in Jesus Christ, right? Like that's, that's it. Like uh, we, it's, it's by faith and nothing else. But John Calvin, the, the, the famous theologian, noted... That faith is never alone. Like right alongside faith is works. And so motivated by the gospel we've received, we go and explain the gospel to other people. My four prayers today for our church, for God's church in general, is that we may be a church that welcomes the broken, both here and outside. We welcome the broken. Well, I pray that God may grant us big thinking, risk-taking, obstacle-leaping faith, that we believe that God wants to do miracles. I pray that we would be a church of doers and not just hearers. And I pray that we may be a church that has gospel motivations and gives gospel explanations. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for what you did in the life of this man. And I pray, God, that you would do that over and over and over in the life of the people in this building today, the person sitting in, this, in a chair today that's hurting and broken, they need you. I pray that you would restore and bind up the brokenhearted, Father, that you would do what only you can do. Father, I pray that you would use us as we scatter. Do a great work through your church. May people say, we've never seen anything like this before. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.